All right, we're uh, here with George Ortega again. It's me in Mendham, Gary, and uh, talking more about this uh, will thing, this in the free part, which is kind of silly. Um, <laughs> but the will itself is also kind of silly when you really think about it. And that's really what the conversation's about: is how do you think about it the right way? And so I'm kind of thinking that um, the words we use to think with uh, uh, the vocabulary. Work. Um, aren't very good, and so <laughs> that's probably part of the problem is our vocabulary doesn't really suit the conversation because we have words like spontaneous and random, and these concepts probably don't have any reality in the material universe. And, you know, that sort of makes it tougher to make the argument. What do you think, George? Yeah, um, absolutely. I, I think that, you know, the concept of will, I mean, like, it depends how you basically, like, the way I think it's been used throughout the centuries is that um, we have a consciousness, all right? There's like, we're conscious of, of ourselves, we're conscious of the world. And so I think will, the way it's generally used is like what identifies us as, as being what, in other words, like right now we're both conscious of, of, of things. So like, Whatever is being conscious, that's, I think, what, what we call the will. So, like, basically, like, with free will, it's like that this kind of thing that's conscious, this entity that's whatever you want to call it, is able to, like, make decisions and act independent of anything outside of it. Yeah. Um, well, I was sort of thinking about that. As I was thinking about a processor that's getting processed, you know, it's like it's like a computer that's writing its own software in a sense, you know, it's like it's always getting feedback, and so it's always living in a feedback loop, you know, whatever we put out becomes part of what we take in, we see ourselves act, we react to that also. Um, and I was also thinking about the mechanics of how our brain works, and what our brain is really doing is this stuff comes in, and my brain creates a feeling you know, I have a feeling about almost every vocabulary word, right? I mean, you either have a kind of a positive feeling or kind of like you either like a color, you dislike a color. You like a food, you dislike a food. I mean, every word kind of has a a scariness or a friendliness to it. Well, we have a feeling. And so our brain is first creating a feeling. And then the brain is sitting there looking at the feeling and saying, what do I do about this? I have a feeling. And now it's absorbing the feeling as information. So it's like converting, you know, slight into you know, math, and then the math back into light, you know, and that's kind of like what our brain is. It's a conversion unit. It's just kind of converting the external world into a feeling, and then it's reacting to the feeling and acting on the external world. Yeah, and that's one of the problems for this concept of free will. Uh, we don't really, in real time, have control of our feelings. I mean, we can learn how to develop control over time, you know, but, you know, as, you know, moment by moment, these feelings just come to us. You know, they're, they're programmed based on our past experience, whatever, whatever we're, like, experiencing them as being connected with. So that, that's another good way of just, like, demonstrating if these feelings are influencing, you know, our thoughts and then influencing what we do and all, that's not free will. That You know, free will would be have, have to be free from, from these feelings that we're not in control of. Right, it'd be like free from your definitions of words, right? I mean, I have a definition for every word. I have a, you know, I have a, a, a history that I'm connected to with that word, right? So every word in the vocabulary, if I say trilobite, I have a whole knowledge base tied to trilobites. I mean, as silly as it sounds, I mean, I have pictures in my head of little trilobites swimming. I have, you know, dissections of trilobites. I have fossils of trilobites. I have all that stuff in my head. And that stuff in my head is going to decide how I'm going to react to the word trilobite. And uh, everybody has a different definition in their head. So words mean something different to people, and that's why they react different. And we think that this all, like, hey, it, we all, we're all unique or something. But we're all made of the same, you know, basic colors. It's just that there's a lot of colors and you can mix them in a lot of ways, right? So, I mean, you can be like 10% blue and have 15% red and 20% this, and you know what I mean? And if I just multiply how many colors there are available, you end up having a nuance that's individual, but, you know, it's only individual, you know, in, in appearance. You, you know what I'm saying? It's still mechanically created. You're still within the limits of how you've been exposed, what, what colors got shoved into you. You're still, you're still stuck with the ingredients, you know, and that's all there is. There's just different ways of cooking a person, 
there's not really different ingredients. Yeah, you know what I mean? Stir absolutely. Even more than that, Gary, because basically to have a free will, we'd have to be making conscious decisions. In other words, our conscious mind would have to be deciding. Now, the problem for that is like all of these memories, all of these words, all of these constructs, they are not stored in our conscious mind because our conscious mind, consciousness is simply limited to awareness. Consciousness is fleeting. We're aware of one concept, one perception, one whatever, and so like it's like a stream of consciousness. Whereas like the storage mechanism for all that we learned in the past, for our our words, our principles, all this stuff, it's in the unconscious. That's where all that um, all the the data, and that's where the processing, that's where the principles are all stored. Because again, we're, we have no consciousness of of the entire store of, of what we know. You know, so it's in the unconscious. Yeah, well, that, that's where the stream is. I mean, the stream is in, you know, the stream is really coming from your subconscious and it's flowing into your conscious, and that's just the way it is. I mean, if you don't have any reservoir of knowledge, you have a very weak stream, and if you have a reservoir of experience, you're going to have a very vibrant stream. So, like, some words are I'm very reactive to. You know, they mean a lot to me because I have a whole lot of stories tied to them. In other words, it's like, okay, whatever. You know what I mean? They go right past you. You know, they just no, stream... They stream right past you because they don't have, they don't represent any, they don't have any magnitude, you know, to you. Yeah, Gary, my point is that, like, okay, like, we, for example, we have to study for tests because we can't just, like, will ourselves to remember whatever we, we want to remember or need to remember. We have, like, thousands, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of words that are stored in our memory. But again, we're, we can't access any of, the, any of that stuff just at will. Basically, it's this this storage mechanism. In other words, it's stored in the unconscious part of our mind. So I think what's going on is like the unconscious is our mind. Okay, think of it like the unconscious is our mind. That's where all the data is. That's where all the processing is. In other words, like when we make a decision, is it moral? Is it rational? Does it make sense? You know, and all this stuff. We're not when we're thinking. We're not aware of any of this. We're just aware of like you know, do I eat an apple or an orange? And then like we decide. So if yeah, all the, no, the the we decide is always still the problem, right? Because when we say we, we already know that to between each other, right? The nudge nudge. There's no such thing as a we, you know. There's just brain, and and brain says brain says, you know. And so some one part of your brain basically tells another part of the brain, kind of an idea. I think it's a. I think it works for me anyway as a metaphor is to understand the brain is basically an input device and an output device, and consciousness is in between, just watching. That's what I'm saying. In other words, like when I say the word we, we are our unconscious. Our, the unconscious is, is what really like you've seen uh, research, for example, you put a person in a room with a, um, a picture of a library on the wall. That person will talk more softly, has no idea why they're doing it. There's a lot of priming experiments that demonstrate that the unconscious is really actually deciding for us, you know, what we think we're deciding consciously. So basically the idea is like our mind is the unconscious. That's the quote unquote we were referring to and we have absolutely, we're not only not in control of the unconscious, we're not even aware of its existence. You know, we can only infer it through experimentation. I guess we're just kind of talking past each other with vocabulary again, but yeah, I mean, I, I'm agreeing with your, your, your in principle. I guess it's just finding the right words because I, I would say, I guess I wouldn't go so far as to say our will doesn't but because our will is one of the programs, so every bit of our will is always one of the programs. It's just one of them. It's one that wins. So either your desire wins or your principles win in a lot of, like, say, ethical equations, right? I mean, either you, either you guilt yourself into not doing something, you know what I mean, or you do the something that you feel kind of tenuous about, like maybe I'm not being ethical, and so you have a dilemma and you have to make a decision. You make the decision based on how strong either your principles are or how strong your desire is. and But one of those wills wins. They're like two separate wills. They're two separate interests. They're two separate desires, essentially. My desire to be a good person, my desire to have what I want. And those two things compete, but the competition is already a given. There's not going to be any real fight. It's already decided, in a sense. Yeah, I agree. And, and it's decided at the level of the unconscious. That's what I'm saying. So, like, you know, like, I think what they've discovered is there's no, like, central processing center, at least that they've um, discovered in the brain, 
you know, I think the brain, instead of like doing serial processing like our consciousness does, it does parallel processing. You know, it has like the desires, it has the principles, it has the want, the 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 morals, all these kinds of like like you're saying, all these kinds of competing motivations, and like who knows how, you know, we have our basic principles that we're conscious of, like you know, is it the right thing to do? Is it what we want? But aside from that, we have all these kinds of like inputs in our unconscious that are competing in, and like you like you were saying before, the strongest of them will win out. And when the strongest one wins out, that's when we become aware of what our unconscious has decided. Yeah, it's it's when we become aware of what our real will is, you know, in a sense, the will that's going to be the dominant one. But yeah, I would say that there is probably some place where it's all decided, but it's just a measuring thing. It's just measuring how much weight you've attached to something. So how much weight the word honor means to you and how much weight the word, you know, having what you want means to you. You know what I mean? Your selfishness, your desire, your compulsion, your impulse, you know, those kind of things. So those are real measurements of real weight, I would say, that your brain is seeing the attachments, that's seeing what's attached to those concepts, and one of those concepts has something stronger attached to it. You know, it's like it's, it's like pulling weeds. Some weeds have deep roots, some weeds have weak roots, and so the wind with weak roots breaks, the one with the stronger roots wins, and that's the thing that becomes you. Exactly, and the problem for free will is like all of this processing, I mean, when we make a decision, you know, what, what we want for lunch and stuff, we're not aware of all this competition between all the different areas of our brain that are competing for attention or, or you know, to, to be fulfilled and all. This, we're not aware of any of them. That, that is a perfect indication that the processing of what we decide is happening in the unconscious. If, if, if it was happening in our conscious mind, we could tell you exactly what was going on, what, what all the different weights were, were be and their, their concentrations and all. Yeah, and I'd almost argue if people were honest with themselves, you know, reflective, you can sort of trace a little bit of it. You can see the vapor trail of your thought process, you know, of the of the of what was happening inside your mind bef before and after you made a decision. And if you really look, you can sort of see parts of it. You know what I mean? You can't see much, but you know what I'm saying. You can get an indication of why you made the decision, what emotional factors and what you know memories and what real things either scared you. you can see the elements of that seduction yeah I agree but then what happens is like can we see what caused that in other words like let's say we have a, a competing desires of like doing the right thing or doing what we want so we kind of like see oh yeah we want to do the right thing right but then like can we see the reason why we decided that you know because that's like part of you know what made us decide and again, we, we, yeah, well, like I said, I think we can see enough of it to know that it's there. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm seeing, we're seeing a, a shadow of it. You know, we're seeing a vapor trail, but it's enough to say, yes, yeah, something was there. Something made the vapor trail, and I can see the trail. I can see the the subtle footprints in my mind going to, I want to be a good person, or the other thought that might have been, I think I can get away with it this time. You know, whatever the thought was, I can see the I can see the footprints going left or going right. Yeah, yeah, um, we, we can see like, kind of like, um, but it's vague, in other words, it's not precise, yeah. you know, we're... we're it, right, right, I'm just saying, it sort of just gives you an indication, though, that there was a process, there wasn't just will took over and just did something, it didn't just do something, there was a process, and there was an argument in your head, and the argument was won by the thing with the bigger roots. All right, so let me ask you something, like, according to the free will belief, um, we... We do things that that we des describe as intelligent. You know, we like you know we did did something or wrote a book. You know, did something that is intelligent. Okay, and we ascribe that intelligence to us as human beings. But without a free will, it's not our intelligence. So what do you make of that? I mean, like if we can't ascribe well, well, that I intelligence, think, I think it is ours. I mean, I think there's no point in saying there aren't dishwashers that wash dishes better than other dishwashers. There aren't closed dryers that dry better than other clothes dryers. So you can, in some sense, say in the absolute sense, this one works better. Now, to say whether it, it had a choice, it didn't, okay? It's either a Maytag or it's a May f flag or something, you know what I mean? It's either the real deal or it's not the real deal. So that's the catch, is that, yes, you can, you can, if you, if you want to say, okay, I am an exceptionally brilliant brain that's very efficient in processing information and I'm very logical, you can probably say that. If you want to say, I deserve it, 
well, then you're getting silly, right? Because you like, couldn't be anything other than what you are. You didn't make you. The books made you. The, the knowledge made you. The experiences made you. You didn't really make you, so you really can't take credit. But it feels good to take credit, right? Right, and that's, that's my point. In other words, like, yeah, we are actually you know, quote unquote, doing whatever is intelligent, but because of this causality, because everything has a cause, there's a cause of, of why we did what we did, and there's a cause to that, and a cause to that, and these causes regress to before we were born. So essentially, you know, what's happening before the planet was created, before the galaxy created, was created, you know, was leading in a very direct causal chain to what we did. So in, in a certain sense, sometimes I think it's like we're actually manifesting the will or the intelligence of, like, as far as we know, the Big Bang. Exactly. Well, I wouldn't go back that far because I don't think it did it in a, you know what I mean? There wasn't enough of a construct to say here's how it's evolving, you know what I mean? But now we've seen the evolution of humanity and its consciousness, so to speak. And we can find the characters in history who, you know, made an important contribution in the sense that their brain processed pretty well and, and added to the, the knowledge base. And I, I would almost say, I, could, I, can, I can say for my, me personally, I could say something like, well, Charles Dickens was a, you know, a huge creator of my character. You know, I, I didn't, if it wasn't for Charles Dickens, I might have a lot less character because he gave me insights into, into my behavior and my interaction with humanity that were very valuable in terms of, I saw incredible logic in it and reasoning and sensibility, and so it means something to me, and it meant something to me. And so, in a sense, Dickens made me. You know, these events made me. Right. Well, I mean, the other, the other, because I'm, I'm trying to, like, the question I'm trying to answer is, like, if we don't have a free will, what we do isn't really fundamentally up to us, so it has to be fundamentally up to something. You know, and like, I, you know, I think yeah, that we... Well, I'm just saying that's what I would say is it's fundamentally up to the inevitability of this evolution process. It's just inevitable that the thing will progress. You know that the it's like the, the formation of a stalagmite. You can't stop it. You know what I mean? It's going to form, and right. we, this is going to happen. We were going to take this this shape, and the shape will come to a point. And you could almost argue that intelligence does the same thing. Maybe it's a stalagmite. You know, it comes up from. You know what I mean? It perfects itself at, through time. Well, that's what I'm saying. In other words, when I, when I don't attribute intelligence to human beings, I'm attributing it to the universe. Because, like, for example, you, you take a building, right? You take all the materials that, that comprise a building. If you were to just, like, you know, randomly or whatever, without any purpose order, just, you know, fling them about, there's no way you'd come up with a building. So, in other words, like, the, the design of a building is, like, the planning and the the putting together of a building is is ordered, it's processed, it's an intelligent you know process. So I'm, I'm what I'm saying is like because we don't have a free will and we're not really doing anything intelligently, we have to I think define the universe as intelligent. And now I wouldn't say intelligent in the sense like for example I don't understand why the universe would have created suffering because I think that's completely unintelligent. But just like you know, being responsible for like governing the laws of nature and for like you know. Evolving for for being the process. Yeah, by which I, I just don't. I, I just don't see any point in giving it any kind of anthropomorphic capacity. It's not a brain that makes, and we're brains that make. You know, we're doers, and the universe isn't a doer. The universe is the universe. It doesn't really have a. It, you know, it has such simple and crude forces that are dictating the interaction. So I, I like a word like evolution made it. Just because evolution made the, you know, there wouldn't be any conversation, there wouldn't be any thinking if it wasn't for the invention of a neuron, and evolution made neurons possible. You can't have a neuron without evolution, right? So, you know, neurons won't happen chemically all by themselves. They won't happen outside of this idea of trapping matter in a funnel of, of change, and, and that's what evolution has done. It's trapped matter in, in this funnel that obliges it to change. Yeah, and, and you're right, and I, I, you know, I agree completely with evolution, you know, I, I, you know, absolutely, but the thing is, like, you know, we, we understand that nothing happens at random, you know, random is kind of like another way of saying that things are uncaused or unordered, you know, so like, in other words, if evolution is not a random process, in the strong sense of the word ra random, then it has to be a governed process, in other words, well, like, I know. Here's, here's a good example I think I can give you. The, the same universe could create life and not create life, right? I mean, you could have almost identical universes, just change one little tiny five-second effect, right? So change a five-second fact on Earth, and there's no biological evolution. It remains a dust bowl. I'm just saying those two universes are really different. You know, one has intelligence in it, one doesn't. 
So you wouldn't call the universe that doesn't have any life in it intelligent. You'd just say, hey, it's a bunch of billiard balls banging around, right? So I guess what I'm arguing is, is the key factor is a circumstantial event, and you wouldn't really say it's it's a quality all universes have by nature. You know what I'm saying? The new the, the universe doesn't evolve replicating DNA molecules as a matter of course. There could be universes where it never ever happens. Or Gary, Gary, I, I I accept what you're saying. I understand what you're saying in theory. You know, in theory, yes, there could be there could have been an, another universe. There could be and like you know, technically, I think uni meaning one. I think there's only one reality. But, you know, for example, before the Big Bang, there must have been something, or there might have been something, whatever. So basically my point is, like, the, the, the universe we're aware of, you know, has, has constructed human beings with this brain, the most complex structure we know of in the, in the universe. And well, so, like, it's, no more complex. it's no more complex than elephants, and it's no more complex than gorillas. It's no more, so, you know, when people start no, I agree. human brains, I'm not that impressed by human brains, to tell you the truth. I think they're pretty very dysfunctional, and the very fact that we have to have this conversation is sort of evidence of their dysfunction. Um, I mean, it really shouldn't be a conversation we need to have about the fact that we're reflexive organisms. I mean, reflexes are all over us. We're covered with reflexes. Why wouldn't we think that's what our brain is doing? No, Gary, no, all right. I agree with you that, you know, our brains relative to the brains of other species, you know, I, I think we're in the same ballpark. I don't think we're, we're, we're you know, I think some... some we're just some, educated. We're just, we have a knowledge base they don't have. They can't acquire language. They can't acquire the knowledge manipulation, so therefore they remain ignorant. But they're, yeah, they're exactly the same as we are functionally. They're just ignorant. Right. And so the reason I bring this up is because, like, you know, people have various reasons why they can't accept that we don't have a free will. One of them is that, like, all right, well, if we don't have a free will, we're just puppets, we're robots, we're computers, you know, we're just going along for the ride. And, like, so in other words, it robs them of a certain kind of, like, uh, purpose or dignity. So in other words, I bring up the universe as a, quote, unquote, intelligent entity to try to, like, find some kind of way of, of getting to them under, to understand, hey, we're not manifesting our wills of, as human beings. We're manifesting the will of the, quote, unquote, will of the universe. Yeah, I, I, I know, but I just, I guess I'm just not, I, you know, I'm just not as comfortable with that. That sounds like um, fluffy, you know, that sounds like gilding lilies or gilding the truth, and I really don't want to gild it. I just want to say, look, this is hey, it's the way it is, okay? We don't like the facts. Well, the facts are the facts. And the truth is, is I didn't make me. Uh, I'm just a, a, a reflexive reaction to the culture and the evolution of the human species. And uh, I'm just a manifestation of that one manifestation in a sea of 7 billion humans right now. And that's the truth of it. It is not magic. It's just biological organisms being fundamentally and mainly controlled by biological instincts. And we have this faculty of intelligence, which gives us the ability to manipulate and process knowledge um, through the, the process of logic. And what do I need a free will for when I have logic? Yeah, well, it's interesting with logic. Cause it, I mean, like, we do have logic, but apparently it's not very strong because if it was, you know, sufficiently strong, you know, not so very few of us would, would get that we don't have a free will. Well, exactly. I mean, that's the, the competition is really between the integrity of the truth and what people want to believe because it feels better. You know, they want to feel good. They don't want to feel bad. That's a basic fundamental drive inside of us. So people are people find it gravitational to go to this, the food that tastes good rather than the food that's healthy. I mean, this, this is a problem that's systemic with human beings is they don't take this seriously enough to figure out, gee, maybe I ought to modify my tastes to suit what is healthy. Yeah, and I, th I think our challenge is, you're right, I think we're going to have to package this message to, to the world, to people, in a way that they can understand that it's going to be in their best interest to abandon the belief in free will. That they, they need to understand that to the extent they believe in free will, the people they, they care about in their lives, you know, w when they do something wrong, that they're going to blame them, they're going to like get into conflicts with them, and when they do something wrong, they're going to blame themselves. In other words, like this belief in free will just causes so much unnecessary, irrational suffering for everybody. Yeah, I, I'm also not too strong on that one. I want to. I, I think we need to be bludgeoned by the truth. I think people need to be um, 
I think they need to take more responsibility, not less. I think they got to take the game a lot more seriously. So I want to pound, I want to pound them with all kinds of guilt, and uh, because it's real, it's a fact. We are guilty. We are squandering our intelligence. We're squandering each other's welfare. We're disregarding the most valuable thing in the universe, which is the sentient organism, and we are grinding them up and eating them like they're tasty cake. And so, yeah, I want people to feel like shit about themselves because they they suck, and that's that's pretty much my opinion. Humans well, suck. I <laughs> want them to understand that. I, I hear you. I mean, like, I'm a vegan, you know. Like, I can't understand how, like, you know, this world just, what, what we do to these farm animals, it's like, uh, it's beyond cruel. Uh, if you like that approach, Gary, there's a guy, um, James B. Miles from the UK. He just published a book. It's coming out in hardcover later this month. The Kindle version's already out. It's called The Delusion of Free Will. If you like that approach of bludgeoning people with the truth, this guy does this. First he goes, he, he attacks Dennett and these compatibilists, like, Mercifully, I mean, un un unmercifully, I mean, ruthlessly. The, the book is excellent. I mean, like, he, re he really does that approach, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I don't really want it to come down to an approach. I guess I just, I just want people to honestly understand, and because the honest understanding is going to be the most durable and the most reliable. I don't want them to do it because it's in their own interest. I want them to do it because they understand it. You know, and that's, I know, Gary. You know, I know it, it might not be a huge distinction in, in practicality, but it's a... It's a very important distinction in terms of what I think the endurability of a philosophy has to go all the way to its base. Well, I mean, I agree with you. I would prefer, I would prefer that people would just like accept, you know, the the nature of our our humanness, you know, why we do things because it makes sense from com from just simple logic. But because we are part programmed whether by society you know for whatever reason to to be like you know seek pleasure avoid pain to kind of like go with what feels best rather than what makes the most sense i think you know we i think we may need to kind of like lead people into this gradually you know without like you know cuz otherwise we shock them into this and they go into denial you know once they're in denial their their brain shuts off and then, you know, so we have to find sure some kind of... See, I'm not sure it does, because I, when I think about how I got here, you know, how I got to being able to be comfortable with, recognized myself as some sort of silly addict who's just going through the world chewing, um, I got there because the truth was difficult, but, I mean, that's how I got here. You know, I, I didn't get here because somebody told me a happy story. I got here because I reflected on my reality and the fact that I need to mean something. And the only way you're going to mean something is to do something good, not something bad in the world. And that's just the truth. Your life is what you do with it. I, I yeah. understand. I agree with you. But, Gary, I mean, you are not the average person. You're, you're much more of an intellectual. You, you, can't, you can't ascribe the quality well, that you have. <laughs> I, I am now, but I wasn't born that way. So I guess that would be my argument. It was yeah. just an acquisition of experience, and I guess I'm just saying I think I can duplicate that experience by just giving people a little bit of Dickens, a little bit of the, a little taste of it. Uh oh, please. All right, we got <laughs> no, what, okay. a couple, couple more minutes okay. left, right? No, it's okay. I'm still here. Okay. Um, um. So, but yeah, no, it's okay. It's a, it, like I said, it is an interesting subject. The approach of of you know, conversion and propaganda and all that kind of way you you have to get to people. And I'm all, like I said, I'm all for theatrics. I'm all for humor. I'm all for anything that gets the message to people. So I'm not, I'm not saying everybody has to be guilted to death. I'm just saying that it's, if I was to say I have a preference, I, my preference is, is that I want people to be humbled into this philosophy, not selfishly thinking they're winning. You know what I mean? I want them to, understand why this truth needs to be respected. Yes, just the same with Darwin and evolution. People were humbled into to accepting that we evolved from lower life, quote unquote lower life forms, you know, more simple life forms. And so absolutely, that's, that's like, that's intellectual integrity that would allow them to do that. So again, yeah, uh, whether they're able to anytime soon, I don't know, but like, I think with an idea like this, we have to keep like saying it over and over because it's going to take people like a lot of times of hearing this before they can accept it. And a lot of, and hearing it in a lot of different ways, you know what I'm saying, arguments that do have sugar on them and arguments that don't. <laughs> All That's of the true. arguments are good. And so let's do whatever, whatever chocolate we have to put on this grasshopper, let's put it on. <laughs> um, Sounds good. 
All right. Well, it's good. Another good conversation, George. Thanks. Thank you, Guy. All right.